Um, I wanted to thank the Kogut Center and the um, Department of English, the Department of French, the Department of Modern Culture and Media, Africana Studies, um, for making this visit possible. Our speaker today is Sarah Nuttall, who is Research Professor of English at the University of Stellenbosch in South Africa and the incoming director of the Witz Institute for Social and Economic Research in Johannesburg. She is the author of Entanglement, Literary and Cultural Reflections on Post-Apartheid, the editor of Beautiful Ugly, African and Diaspora Aesthetics, and the co-editor of many books, including most recently, Johannesburg, The Elusive Metropolis, and Load Shedding, Riding On and Over the Edge of South Africa. Now, Sarah's work offers a sustained study of formations of affect and mutuality across the surfaces of cultural production through a critical paradigm she has described as entanglement. Entanglement, as she argues, is a condition of being twisted together or entwined. It speaks of an intimacy gained, even if it was resisted, um, ignored, or uninvited. Her provocative insistence on the intertwined and the intimate thus moves us away from practices of symptomatic reading and from a critical optics of sameness and difference, even as she emphasizes again and again the role of history and geography in the shaping of intellectual practice. And her talk today is titled Mandela's Mortality. Thank you so much. I'm um, really happy to be here. Um, thank you, Monu, and thank you to, to everyone who's made this, um, this visit possible. The paper that I want to present tonight was um, written in part with Ashil Mbembe um, and was commissioned for a book which is coming out next year by Cambridge University Press on Mandela, um, edited by Rita Barnard, who's at Penn. Um, please tell me if the microphone sounds funny. I really. Does it, yeah, it's echoey, isn't it? Anything we can do about that? I'm working on it. Okay. Okay, please do wave at me if it sounds funny. I don't want to sound ridiculous. Um, and I've got a fairly long paper to read. Um, the talk tonight was written um, specifically to think about the relationship between Mandela and death. Um, this includes his own death but also includes the death of others. Uh, and I want to explore his thinking across several decades, in fact, about life and death in general, um, and about the obligations of the living to the dead, and about his own inner world as he experienced deep suffering and loss, states of being which, in his words, one never wants to experience ever again. So in order to reflect as fully as possible on Mandela's views of death and its ability to speak contradictorily to the living, I want to pay particular attention to the dialectics of presence and absence, disappearance and reappearance, that in fact have been a hallmark of his life, um, from the time he went underground in 1961 to his re-emergence to freedom in 1990. Now let me say at the start um, that Nelson Mandela, of course, is very much alive. He's 94 years old and he's pretty frail, um, and his death is clearly something that the global community as well as South Africans live with, yeah, I could try. Do you want me to do that? Should I turn it off? Really? Okay. Should we turn it off? No, but then it becomes fluffy. No? Is that better? Okay. All right. Well, anyway, let me start more slowly by saying that you know Mandela is very much alive. He's a frail 94-year-old living in uh, Johannesburg sometimes and in Kunu at other times, um, the village where he was born. Um, in trying to focus on Mandela's own thinking about death and life, you know, I'm really not playing with his death. Um, some people are surprised by the nature of the talk that I, that I give, and I've given a few times. Um, Rather, I'm asking us to think about it in terms that might, in fact, assist us and comfort us. Um, or at least I'm attempting to draw together a set of ideas that might help us to know something, you know, and to think through how we might see for ourselves the coming specter of Mandela's death. His will be, of course, anything but a sudden death. 
nor will his death open onto total absence. Because part of my argument to life of tonight, of course, is that his life has been lived as a long oscillation um, between encounter, distance, and separation, solitude and conviviality, the life of the day and the life of the night. Um, I want to think particularly tonight about his writings about the prison cell, to which he refers so often, um, as a sort of a prefiguration of his final departure, and almost a purgatorial space, in fact. Um, his death appearing in this context as the final station in an endless process of transfiguration. I want to look at some of the recent images of Mandela. They've been far fewer since 2010, and I want to look at them squarely in the face and to say something about um, these images um, of his really very old self now. Um, his increasing bodily frailty, his inability to walk properly, um, therefore, he dances quite more often with his arms than with his legs, um, and his aging face. I also want to say something to you tonight about the act of planning for his death, which is taking place in South Africa, um, and the nature of the controversies arriving, at, oh, sorry, arising from the preparation for his final passing and his burial. Um, and to meditate a little bit on what is at stake for people in his death, um, in facing his death, and I'll close with some remarks about the shock that I think will constitute Mandela's death, however much we prepare ourselves for it, and the language we might find um, to say what we feel on the morning that we wake up to find him gone. The law of mortality, Hannah Arendt wrote, is the most certain and only reliable law of a life spent between birth and death. To be sure, these two most important events in human existence are never directly experienced by the subject himself or herself. They are always either an already happened in the case of birth, one was not present at one's own birth, only in the most nominal sense, I suppose, and a not yet happened event in the case of one's own death. Now, Nelson Mandela was not a witness to his own birth, um, but more than once he has contemplated his own death. Not only, in fact, did he, has he embraced his mortality, uh, but he's attempted to be the owner of his own death. Um, and this is what I want to try to talk about about tonight. Much of my reading this evening draws on the book Conversations with Myself, and I wonder how many people here um, have seen that book. It was published a couple of years ago, and it's really quite different from his um, autobiography, ghost written by Richard Stengel, called Long Walk to Freedom. Um, I think as we very well know, his autobiography is a book which is full of agency and intentionality, um, and it appears to reveal few feelings and very little about his emotional life. And I think people, commentators, have struggled with that for a long time. Um, <clears throat> strong affective lives do surface, though, in the narrative of the life, um, often more actively and obviously than is by now taken for granted. But this wonderful book, Conversations with Myself, offers much stronger articulations of the complex and always unfinished exercise of self-writing or reading the self. <clears throat> On my reading of this text, we do actually encounter a man who is acutely aware of his own vulnerability, at times at war with himself and with his passions, and whose loyalties are deeply divided between his own family and the family of the people, whose encounter with his own destiny, although irreversible, happens in stages almost by accident. He emerges as a man who has suffered in his own body and in his psyche, a lengthy prison sent sentence, hard labor, tasteless meals, grim and tedious boredom, and, quote, the frightful frustrations of a life in which human beings move in complete circles, landing today exactly at the point where they started the day before. We do see, if we read in a particular way, aspects of his pain and devastation, his countless indignities, severe and irrecoverable losses, dramatic separations and invisible wounds, his grief, his helplessness, and his mourning, the kinds of experiences that, quote, eat too deeply into one's being, into one's soul. Now, throughout his active life, Mandela consciously drew a veil over his wounds and misfortunes. He turned his pain into a private secret he was loath to exhibit in public. And while he offered his outer self to the political sphere of men, he shared his inner self with privileged women friends. The truth, he wrote to his daughter Zinzi in 1970, 
is that, quote, my appearance had nothing to do whatsoever with the state of my feelings. The ethos of the struggle, he argued, required the freedom of the freedom fighter, that he or she suppress many of the personal feelings that make one feel like a separate individual rather than part of a mass movement. Now, in reality, this stoic attitude to pain and suffering and loss and the effort to discipline his emotions was one that he learned to cultivate during his childhood at crucial moments of separation. As far as I know, people have not commented on what I'm about to say. Um, in Long Walk to Freedom, as in his later accounts of life underground, moments of separation foreground selfhood as a double. Um, the inner self is released from the shackles of the outer self, and both are kept at a relative distance from each other. Um, Mac Maharaj, who now works in the South African government as a spokesman for President Zuma, spent many years on Robben Island with Nelson Mandela, and he remarked in, in his autobiography, in fact, um, quote, as he has been living through prison, this is Mandela, his anger and hatred of the system has been increasing, but the manifestations of that anger have become less visible. For the transfiguration or sublimation to occur, the inner world of the person must cease to mirror the outer world of the individual or public figure. The release of the psyche and its disconnection from the soma allows for the sublimation of pain and the transfiguration of the self to take place, while silence in the face of death becomes the privileged form of language and speech. The split between the inner self and the outer self is nowhere as manifest as in the scene of circumcision and seclusion, which Mandela offers a vivid and arresting portrait of in his autobiography. To enter manhood, a piece of one's own body has to be cut and buried in the earth in the middle of the night. The newly circumcised man has to paint his naked and shaved body from head to foot in white ochre. It's kind of white dust, um, white paint um, made from, from dust. Um, he must inhabit, then, the appearance of a ghost. Untying one's foreskin, discarding a piece of one's own flesh and burying it in the earth is followed by Man what Mandela calls a re-emergence. The latter implies going down to the river early in the morning, washing away the white ochre and replacing it with red ochre. The last act before the re-emergence consists of the burning of the seclusion lodges. In Khoza tradition, it is forbidden to look back while the seclusion lodges are burning. Now Mandela transgressed this taboo immediately. He looked back. But all that he could see were, quote, two pyramids of ashes. In these ash heaps, he thought, lay a lost and delightful world, the world of his childhood. Of course, the symbolism of colors, red and white, burning matter, clouds of smoke and ash heaps, far from neutral, is directly related to the dialectics of death and regeneration. Mandela viewed every death as a frightful disaster, quote, um, no matter what the cause and the age of the person affected. He distinguished between a gradual slow death, as in the case of illness, um, and the kind of death that claims, quote, a strapping and healthy person in the prime of his life. Living through the second type of death experience could be paralyzing, but each death was a singular event. Although shattering, its meaning could be ungraspable at the moment of its occurrence. For it to be fully to become an event for those who mourned the loss, it had to trigger a remembrance of the deceased as well as memories of other deaths. This is when death, as such, emerged to consciousness as actuality. And in Mandela's case, the death of each individual member of his family, there are many of them, his daughter, his son, and his mother, for starters, produced its full effects mostly after the fact, when it is, was remembered at the occasion of other deaths, a repetition that often became its own spectral presence. Significantly, Mandela missed the burial of most of those who meant a great, de a gr a great deal to him. Such was the case of the regent of Tembuland in the winter of 1942. Such was the case of his mother and his eldest son, Tembekile. His application to the prison authorities was ignored upon the death of his mother, and he was not even favored with the courtesy of an acknowledgement. Missing burials always triggered intractable questions, chief amongst which was the specific nature of the obligations one owes to the dead. A first death in no ways prepares one for the shock of the second. So he says, 
Nothing I experienced in the late 40s and in September last year can be likened to what I went through on July 16. This is the ref a reference to the death of his son, Tembi. Um, Tembi was not the first child of Mandela's to die. The first was his nine-month-old baby daughter with his wife, Evelyn, called Makaziwe. And he speaks about um, the extraordinary pain of that death. I won't uh, speak about it now. Um, and he talks about the degree to which it should have hardened me for similar catastrophes, but it did not. When Tembi died in 1969, at the age of 23, in a car accident, Mandela was on Robben Island, and he describes the death in this way. The news was broken to me at about 2.30 p.m. Suddenly, my heart seemed to have stopped beating, and the warm blood that had freely flown in my veins for the last 51 years froze into ice. For some time, I could neither think nor talk, and my strength appeared to be draining out. Eventually, I found my way back to my cell, with a heavy load on my shoulders, and the last place where a man stricken with sorrow should be. As usual, my friends here were kind and helpful, and they did what they could to keep me in good spirits. I do not have the words to express the sorrow or the loss I felt. It left a hole in my heart that can never be filled. I returned to my cell and lay on my bed. I do not know how long I stayed there, but I did not emerge for dinner. Some of the men looked in, but I said nothing. Finally, Walter, who's Walter Sisulu, came to me and knelt beside my bed, and I handed him the telegram. He said nothing, but only held my hand. I do not know how long he remained with me. There is nothing one man can say to another at such a time. In later years after his release, it is the deaths of Oliver Tambo and Walter Sisulu that Mandela is least able to handle in terms of defying the public expression of his pain. Walter Sisulu's death, by contrast, perhaps, left him, uh, contrast to that of Oliver Tambo, left him, quote, almost prostrate with grief. What we observe in these descriptions is Mandela's dramatic expression of emotion, the quasi-psychological and somatic effects of the tragedy on him, and the nature of his response, withdrawal to his cell, in a context of extreme powerlessness in which he can strictly do nothing. Now, Mandela's closest encounter with the prospect of his own death occurred during the Rivonia trial in 1964. A police raid on Lily's Lee Farm in Rivonia in Johannesburg resulted in the arrest of almost all of the high command of Umkonto Wesizwe. Put on trial in October for sabotage, the possibility of being sentenced to death was real. I think I'm not going to talk about that tonight because it's so well known to so many people, um, those, early, those early years in 1964. What I'm going to quote from is a, a recent book by Joel Joffe, who has, um, whose book is entitled The State Versus Nelson Mandela, The Trial That Changed South Africa, published in 2007. He writes this, On our way home, we stopped at the jail to talk to the accused. They were calm, living now in the shadow of death. The strain and tension was becoming almost unbearable, yet the only matter they wanted to discuss was how they should behave if, in court if the death sentence was passed. Informed that the judge would ask him whether he had any reason to advance to why the death sentence should not be passed, Mandela responded that he was, quote, prepared to die for his beliefs and knew that his death would be an inspiration to his people in their struggle. There's no easy walk to freedom. We have to pass through the shadow of death again and again before we reach the mountaintops of our desires, he concluded. But in a letter to Sefton Vutella, which appears in this book, Conversations with Myself, in July 1969, he was much more explicit about his will to live. We should be ready to undertake any tasks which history might assign to us, however the price be pay, to be paid may be. I must, however, confess that for my own part, the threat of death evoked no desire in me to play the role of martyr. I was ready to do so if I had to, but the anxiety to live always lingered. But familiarity does breed contempt, even for the hideous hand of death. After many months, of course, as an awaiting trial prisoner. The second um, section that I want to talk about tonight is called The Cell as a Shroud. Some of Mandela's most momentous engagements with death occurred, occurred while he was in prison. Um, and a pivotal space during the carceral years was indeed the cell. It might not have presented the strict appearance of a grave, but in fact it was almost so. 
Measuring eight foot by eight foot, or three paces in length, its features were a mixture of a coffin and a catacomb. It was the actual instantiation of the harshness and grimness that surrounded him for decades. Whenever death struck, as we have seen, it is to his cell that he withdrew or disappeared. A physical space of confinement and solitude, the cell became a shroud, a space of mourning and confrontation with oneself and with the memory of the dead. Now the practice of disappearing dated from the time that he went underground. For years before his final arrest for treason and sentencing, Mandela lived in fact in a twilight world, tipping this way and that between the worlds of living and dead, day and night, visible and invisible, presence and absence. Living underground, he has remarked, requires a seismic psychological shift. Nothing is innocent, everything is questioned. You cannot be yourself, you must fully inhabit the role you have assumed. He continued that in some ways, this was not much of an adaption for a black man in South Africa. Under apartheid, a black man lived a shadowy life between legality and illegality, between openness and concealment. To be black in South Africa meant not to trust anything which was not unlike living underground for one's entire life. I became a creature of the night, he writes. I would keep to my hideout during the day and emerge to do my work when it became dark. The key to being underground is being invisible, he comments in his autobiography. I like to see the coming of the dawn, the change between day and night. The transition from life underground to life in a cell was marked by the degrading ritual of Thawuza, when in 1952 Mandela was taken to Johannesburg prison, he was stripped completely naked and then lined up naked against the wall. Rituals of nakedness are complemented by isolation, usually associated with deprivation of meals. And of his first experience of isolation, Man Mandela remarks, I found solitary confinement the most forbidding aspect of prison life. There was no end and no beginning. There is only one's mind which can begin to play tricks. Was it a dream or did it happen? I had nothing to read, nothing to write on or with, no one to talk to. The mind begins to turn in on itself and one desperately wants something outside oneself on which to fix one's attention. After a time in solitary, I relished the company even of the insects in my cell and found myself on the verge of initiating conversations with a cockroach. But it was the regime of hard labor that finally put a ghostly stamp on Mandela's prison experience. For decades, he worked at the quarry with the heat and the sun's rays reflecting off the lime into his eyes. The glare hurt his eyes, which streamed while his face became fixed in a permanent squint and the dust swirled all over him. By the end of the day, he writes, our faces and bodies were caked with white dust. We looked like pale ghosts, except where rivulets of sweat had washed away the lime. When we returned to our cells, we would scrub ourselves in the cold water, which never seemed to rinse away the dust completely. Obviously, it's very, very similar to the circumcision scene, isn't it, of the ghostly presences of the men in white ochre. Significant during the Robben Island years are Mandela's dreams, almost always ghostly narratives, usually about arriving at his house in Orlando Soweto and finding no one at home. These are preceded by an actual event involving Evelyn, his first wife. After his arrest and imprisonment for two weeks in 1956, he records, he received one visit from Evelyn. But when I left on bail, I found that she'd moved out and taken the children. I returned to an empty, silent house. She had even removed the curtains, and for some reason, I found this small detail shattering. Mandela wrote to Winnie, sometimes I feel like one who's on the sidelines, who has missed life itself. The prison cell in these accounts appears then as a space of isolation and loneliness, capable of jeopardizing Mandela's personhood. But it is also a place of ascetic detachment and mourning. It operates as a shroud over his prisoner's existence. Yet, as we will see, it also allows Mandela to perform a practice of regeneration. In prison, he struggled the most in relation to how to let go of attachment. It is here that he felt the loss of beloved objects as losses of his own self. The objective, wretched conditions of prison separated his ego from his body and the limits placed upon it and its movements, separating selfhood from the most brutal aspects of pain, the threat of complete objectification. 
He created a division in his self between psyche and soma in order to attain a certain state of detachment. An example of this removal is his sexual life, his celibacy, let's call it what it is, of which he speaks very little. Now when Richard Stendhal, his collaborator on Long Walk to Freedom, asks him how he dealt with the idea that, quote, you might never make love to a woman again, that your sexuality would just atrophy, he answers as follows. Oh well, one gets used to that. It's not that hard to control yourself. I mean, I was brought up in high schools, boarding schools, where you were without women for almost six months, and you exercised discipline of yourself. And then when I went to prison, I resigned myself to the fact that I had no opportunity for sexual expression, and I could deal with that. I must say six months is very different from 27 years, but that's what he said. Um, <clears throat> He held on to the assurance that joy was possible when almost everything except the right to be human and free had been given up. In prison, he encountered the reality of affliction and the void, but he was able to build a bridge back to the world left behind. This bridge was built with trusted others, especially as we saw above, women. In his letters, he deliberately tried to remain in contact with a universe much wider than his prison cell. Now, I want to remark in passing here on the kind of reading I've been undertaking of Mandela. Um, um, some of which I've, I've drawn on this evening. Rather than reading Mandela as a symptom or as a text requir requiring deconstruction, I've been collecting what he has said about death and mortality. I've tried to bring it to the surface to see what kind of pattern emerges and what happens when you look at Mandela with this new pattern in mind. And this has really pointed me to more general social affective domains, which are not generally discussed in relation to Mandela that he separated his ego from his body, and that he fully embraced his own death. These emerge as key for me to the questions that everybody always asks about Mandela. How did he end up occupying the position of a Stoic? Where is his interiority? How do you move beyond the stereotype of Mandela? This bringing to the surface helped me to short circus a complex theoretical scaffolding, um, which would, would, I think, have obscured the kind of reading I've ended up making. Now this experience of or experiment in reading recalls remarks by several other US-based critics recently. Benjamin K. Han has argued that rather than interpret celibacy as repressed homosexuality, as people have been trying to do for years in relation to Mandela, never successfully, that we adopt a depthless hermeneutic that would take celibacy as the absence of sex that it is. This is significant, obviously, in relation to my remarks about uh, Mandela's sexual life. Um, Anne Stoller, in Along the Archival Grain, looks at imperial violence that was never hidden and attends to the colonial state's interests in family life as a genuine preoccupation, not as a metaphor for something else. These understandings of what one can learn from surfaces or from that which is not a metaphor of something else resonate with a, really, a, a rarely cited statement Foucault made about his relationship to archives. Rather than dig for relations that are secret, hidden, more silent or deeper than consciousness, he, he wrote, he describes himself as seeking to define the relationships on the very surface of discourse and as someone who attempts to make visible what is invisible only because it's too much on the surface of things. It's a bit like reading Mandela, you know, that you read this autobiography and it appears that there's very little interiority there. And then you look on the surface of things, but you see so much more than you saw in the first place, and so many people seem want to see. Now, it's worth considering the transition from the cell as a shroud or a catacomb to the cell house of Mandela's first freedom. I don't know how many of you know this, but Mandela's Kunu house is built on the model of his last prison house at Victor Frestaire prison. In Long Walk to Freedom, Mandela writes, I've always believed that a person should have a home within sight of the house where he was born. After being released from prison, I set about plans to build a country house for myself in Kunu. By autumn 1993, the house was complete. It was based on the floor plan of the house I had lived in at Victor Frestaire. People often commented on this, but the answer is simple. The Victor Frestaire house was the first spacious and comfortable home I ever stayed in. And I liked it very much. I was familiar with its dimensions, so at Kunu I would not have to wander at night looking for the kitchen. 
Isaac and Lovo has observed how for Mandela, especially in this example, but in others too, life after prison keeps reproducing its logic, even its architecture. We could remark too that during apartheid, the spaces of segregation included spaces like schools and churches and cemeteries, but also micro spaces like the house, which functions at a, as a key loci for the staging of humiliation. Mandela makes the counterintuitive move of embracing the prison house as the final staging post on the path to freedom, but also as the most comfortable house he's ever lived in, thus once again subverting the logic of the system which sought to contain and break him. Conversely, we might consider how in small ways Mandela made his prison cell into a house, a process born, as Vern Harris suggests, of holding his mistakes close to him. Mandela felt that he had made mistakes in his domestic life, had neglected the realm of the home in favor of his political career. Seeking to remedy this, he nurtured the domestic space from prison, gardening, cleaning, caring, and administering to others. His gardening, in turn, led to a revised political vision. Within the spectral seclusion imposed by the life sentence, writes Eleka Boma, gardening allowed the prisoner to explore the spirit of certain key ideas of regeneration and of reconstruction, for example. Now, there have been very um, few images um, available of the aging Mandela, especially since 2010. And I'm going to focus on just two or three of them today. In fact, I think I've got two here. The first is taken in June, of, June July 2010 at his granddaughter's funeral on the morning after the opening ceremony of the World Cup in South Africa. On the night before the opening of the South African hosted cup, Mandela's 13-year-old granddaughter Zinani was killed in a car accident. Her death recalled the many losses Mandela has suffered in relation to children in his family, including that of Tembekile in 1969 and Makaziwe at nine months old. His third child, Mahato, died of an AIDS-related illness in 2005. Zinani was the niece of another Mandela, Kefuo Sekamela, seven, who drowned in a school swimming pool in 2008. The granddaughter of Madiba and Winnie, she was found in the shallow end of the pool at Sacred Heart College in Observatory in Johannesburg, and she was known as an exceptionally good swimmer. It is the deaths of these children that brings Mandela's so-called exceptionalism into another perspective. The fragility of family life is perhaps not so much because of how men of Mandela's generation chose the struggle above family, although that may be a part of it. It is also related to the racialized histories of the body and of family life. Striking is how many men of that generation and the next did not know their children or lost their children or had their children die in accidents and through disease. In what we must take to be a both a racialized and a gendered condition, history reveals that many men then and after had children very young with women they then did not stay with. A profound pattern emerges through the stories of, lo of the loss of these children, a pattern that is striking for its very painful predictability. In the funeral image, Mandela's cheeks are so sunction, sunken I'm sorry, as to completely change the shape of his face. The pall of his skin is different, he looks far older than he does in other pictures, and his grief and despair are revealed in the slackness of his mouth and the angle from which he looks into the camera. It is interesting to recall here, in the sense that the, that the body carries its affective pasts with it, Joffe's description of Mandela after a year on Robben Island. He had withered during his year in a South African jail and looked thin and miserably underweight. His face, formerly well filled out and a rounded, deep, glistening brown, was now hollow-cheeked, a sickly pale yellowish color. The skin hung in bags under his eyes. A second photograph of Mandela appeared in Business Day newspaper last year and was taken by Tyrone Arthur. It's a remarkable image, a brilliant study of the human face. A shadow hangs alongside it as if a shroud. Mandela's eyes appear watery, probably the water of aging rather than um, tearfulness. Facial skin changes over time, becoming thinner, most notably around the eyelids. This is accelerated by sun exposure, which damages the skin. His eyes, of course, have years of Robben Island light exposure abuse written into them. 
We've seen how, as Boma puts it during the period of the treason trial, winning freedom was equated with overcoming or cancelling life itself, and how in prison Mandela experienced the feeling of being a living ghost, not present, not presently living, of living on the sidelines of the world. A number of these phrases and formulations could of course be applied more literally to old age itself. The inevitable approach now of death, of being in life but not entirely of the world anymore, of existing on the edges of national politics and public life. The ghostliness that was prefigured by life in the cell is now evoked especially perhaps in this image, a way of life shadowed by its own death, across which uh, life in a shroud across which sh the shadow of death is falling. Mandela's image remained outside of time for many years during his imprisonment and therefore came to embody the eternal potential of the revolutionary moment. In these much later images, many project onto his aging features anxieties about South Africa's future in a moment when the revolution has failed to materialize or at least to achieve uh, its full potential. In the next section, I move much closer to this question by looking at a painting of Nelson Mandela, which provokes the question of, his, of the legacy of his years as, as president in terms of a scene of political autopsy taken from a reference to a 17th century Rembrandt painting. Um, well, images of death can be chaotic and perilous. Um, Obviously, the image is a very unsettling form of deconstruction of a human being and the disassembling of his or her double. And the danger of the image is certainly to liberate signs which are no longer under the control of their maker. An image of a cadaver is even more dangerous, especially when looked at from outside the sphere it is supposed to belong to, which is the funeral space. Um, an image of a corpse is an object of fear and dread. It is even possible to conceive that bringing a corpse into existence through an image can unleash forces that cause the death of the person whose cadaver is depicted. This explains to a certain extent the absolute outcry in South Africa in 2010 when this reworking of Rembrandt's masterpiece, The Anatomy Lesson of Dr. Tulp, was um, painted in a shopping center, um, Hyde Park shopping center, by an unknown Johannesburg artist now identified as Yul Damaso. It depicts a scene of autopsy. It represents the body of Mandela as a corpse. The ANC responded, um, that's the African National Congress, the ruling party, responded to the representation of Mandela's death and autopsy by likening it to witchcraft. That charge seemed to echo or to be haunted by much earlier African traditions in which the image is imbued with tremendous power and ambiguity. The painting drew out through the scandal it created multiple anxieties that center around Mandela's body. In um, Rembrandt's painting, an autopsy is being performed in front of a small group of spectators, mostly doctors who paid to be in the painting. In Damaso's 2010 version, the late renowned AIDS orphan and Corsi Johnson performs the autopsy on Mandela. Bishop Tutu and politicians de Klerk, President Zuma, uh, Trevor Manuel, Thabo Mbeki, and opposition leader Helen Zilla take the place of the spectators. Commenting on Damaso's painting, which his newspaper reproduced on its front page, deputy editor of the Mail and Guardian, Rapule Tabani, said the artist was grappling with the state of the country's current politics and the meaning of Mandela in that context. You might say that it asks the question, what killed the spirit that Mandela brought to our national life? It should not be seen as a reflection on or anticipation of the literal death of Madiba as a person, but as an inquiry into the state of the nation and its iconography. So um, I'm going to move a little quickly here, but really just as you can obviously see, a complex brew of issues, political patricide, the AIDS crisis killing thousands of South Africans, and fights over claims to the dead man's legacy. It's interesting to me that it has been art and increasingly money which have been the spaces which have emerged as central in debates about Mandela's coming death, in contrast to what we might have expected, pronouncements from the Nelson Mandela Foundation, for example, about processes of memory making. Um, just very quickly, I want, I want to talk about something which you must have picked up in the press, which is the attempt to turn Mandela recently into a commodity. Um, um, and the, 
very ugly arguments that have arisen in relation to that. Um, I, I suppose if I had to put it bluntly, arguments are being waged over whether his corpse will be, his dead body will be the property of the state, of the ANC, or of his family. Um, <clears throat> the recent inscription of Mandela's face on the national currency also turns Mandela into a fiscal thing, a sign of the South African common. Thus he becomes the common property of all imprinted on banknotes exchanged daily across the country. The idea behind this seems to be the conversion of a moral debt into a monetary asset. Of the many arguments over plans for Mandela's impending death, his funeral and his burial, many involve the controversial figure of his grandson Mandla, who is a chief in Mvezo, Mandela's birthplace, and is eager to capitalize on his grandfather's coming death. Now, I just want to make one remark in relation to this, which is this. One of Mandela's biggest preoccupations was always his inability to properly take care of his family, his wife and his children first and foremost, and his wider family too. At one point in conversations with myself, he writes in his diary about how much money he's got, and he owns at that point, somewhere in the 60s, 40 rand, which is about $4. That's, that's all the money he has to his name. He recognized his debt to his family, but significantly, he never formulated this debt in monetary terms. Um, certainly, Mandela's attempt at turning the event of Mandela's death into a source of private revenue um, is a deployment of two sets of symbolic capital, his lineage with Mandela and his position in the politics of chief chieftaincy. Um, essentially, he's dug up the graves of Mandela's family and moved them to Mvezo. Um, to try to make an argument to the state that they hold Mandela's burial in that village um, and attract a whole lot of tourism to that village um, instead of Kunu, where Mandela was born. Um, he's also sold the rights, the TV rights, uh, of his grandfather's funeral to the SABC and pocketed the money. And in a further controversy unfolding as we speak, South African police have opened an investigation after two international news agencies set up surveillance cameras outside Mandela's home in Kunu. Police declined to name the media outlets, but British-based Reuters and US news agency, the Associated Press, both confirmed that they have set up cameras outside the ex-president's home. After the cases were opened, police spokesman in South Africa, Vish Naidu, said that the media outlets could face criminal charges for violating a law that restricts access to sensitive areas. The cameras were positioned some time ago with the knowledge of the authorities. The cameras are not turned on. They are not spying on Mr. Mandela's home. Associated Press spokesman Paul Colford commented, they're part of the preparedness that AP and other large news organizations customarily make in the event of a major news story involving a former world leader. But Chieftainess Nokwanele Balinzulu, who lives near the Mandela house, said, I agreed to having those cameras there, but I'm not going to say anything else. Bet you she was paid. Okay, um, the, I have two more sections to my talk and then I'm wrapping up, and they're both short. The section I want to move to next is called Letting Go. Um, Vern Harris, chief archivist at the Mandela Foundation in South Africa, when asked recently about Mandela's imminent passing, said this, we feel that he's already gone as an active voice who offers us a last resort. He is no longer with us. He has been frustrated by our dependence on him. He wants to see us walking without him. We are so damaged, there is no quick fix. We must allow him to go. Harris recalled Mandela's words to the foundation at the moment of his retirement from retirement. It's now in your hands. In urging them to move forward, Harris recalls, Mandela suggests, suggested they keep in mind three working principles. That justice be a guiding argument in any decision reached that, quote, I don't want a mausoleum to me, and that, quote, you don't need to protect me. In learning to live without Nelson Mandela, as Harris put it towards the, the end of his remarks at Duke University recently, memory itself has to be subject to the dialogical, to contestation, to different versions. And so the Nelson Mandela Fund, if you visit them in South Africa, are, are currently putting officials from the um, the NIA, the National Intelligence Agency, around a table um, with people who are fighting for freedom of information in South Africa. They're also putting around a table the perpetrators of xenophobic violence in 2010 um, with the 
several people who were the victims of that violence. Um, so, I mean, in that sense, which is so different from arguments about money and art that we've been looking at, um, the foundation is trying to embody a particular kind of political legacy. Okay, my last section is called The Emptiness of Words. Um, I want to focus, in conclusion, on the struggle to give meaning to Mandela's frailty and impending death, which I think we probably all share. Um, and I think that that struggle is um, against a regurgitation of words that are too empty or which we have heard too often before. How is it that language can rise to the occasion of Mandela's coming death? Word is that every head of state in the world has, an, has uh, expressed a desire to attend his funeral. But what will we say? What can be said in a manner that might fill the emptiness with language that won't empty out the words so fully as to produce unbearable disappointment? Now, Roland Barthes has written that the stereotype is the word repeated without any magic, without any enthusiasm, as though it were natural, as though by some miracle this recurring word were adequate on each occasion for different reasons, a constraining form unaware of its own insistence. Barthes speaks of his distrust of the stereotype versus the bliss of the new word or the untenable discourse. The stereotype, Barthes writes, is the nauseating impossibility of dying. For about then, language usually resumes in its consistent stable form, the stereotype. But the bliss of language, its edges, he thinks, are to be found when we depoliticize what is apparently political and politicize what is apparently not. He longs for a form of speaking which resists becoming a moral sight cleansed of any linguistic sensuality. He calls for a language lined with flesh. So I think if we want a shape-shifting language and the undercutting of stereotype as the language within which we might talk about Mandela's death, even if only to ourselves, we have to look at the extraordinary artifact um, that has been Mandela's public life. The message that he seems consistently um, to have most wanted us to hear um, is the invocation of a we, of a community, of a public, which he partakes in and personifies. The splitting of a personal from a public self, of a deep self from a set of surfaces available to public interpretation and projection is deeply imbricated in the message of Mandela's life, the thing that he wants, at least if we read him the way he has deeply indicated he wishes to be read. Insofar as he has spoken about the public moment of his own death, we might take him to be saying something like this. Make this a national moment and give it meaning. Use my body, remember me, by opening another space in politics, even the thing that was unthinkable, but which is possible, the supersession of which we have in our politics as our place in relation to racism, poverty, and oppression. It is not me, the message is, it's you. And yet that is also the most intimate personal moment in which one speaks deeply of a man going alone to his grave. It's perhaps this feeling that makes us think, here is one of the last heroes of our time, in the deeply self-sacrificial sense, self-sacrificial and generative as an act of worlding. And I think that this insistence of doing away with an I um, that is not also a we is, of course, an insistence on the possibility of a dream world, the greatest longing of the 20th century. And I'm going to conclude with a couple of sentences now. Who is to say that the dream has passed or that it has died? South Africa is a conundrum, a volatile mix of all the currents of the 20th century and of its passing. Mandela's life and his impending death stands at the very center point of the life and death of the 20th century. He's of our time, our world time, as an African. And yet who is to know what will happen at the moment of his passing? and when another temporal order might begin, and what the chaotic, volatile, fecund dream space of a life can produce after its death. What is past and what is coming is unclear, though we may feel a sense of unmistakable currents moving around all of us as we speak and move through time and wait for the news that he has slipped away and that we are now without him. Thank you very much. I'm quite happy to take questions. I'm also happy to close earlier than half past seven if you 
don't have a whole lot of questions. So the floor is open. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Um, the, the painter and the painter's commentary on Rembrandt seems to stand for a certain parallel to the logic of the, of the argument you're making. And I want to ask you if that's correct and whether I'm correct in seeing it that way. Uh, what is, what's so shocking about the Rembrandt is its displacement of the Christ image into a completely secular medical theory. Mm -hmm. It seems that this image, in fact, returns the argument back to a strongly Christological image. Uh, and that your talk also, in a way, displaces the political narrative onto a Christological narrative. And I'm wondering if you would accept that, and if it's the case, what does that do to questions of patricide and infanticide? Because the Christ martyrdom is, is, is in a way, as Freud said, the, the movement from patricide narrative to infanticide one. Uh, and how does, that, how does this question, uh, as well as the general structure of the talk, relate to a, a political narrative as displaced, and a political and secular narrative displaced onto a sacred and religious one? Oh, thanks. It's a, it's a question that I need to think about. Um, thank you for that. I think that um, you know, what you're picking up on is a really strong strand in um, South African public life ever since the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, you know, overseen by Bishop Tutu. And the um, choice to provide a non-secular frame to a process of political transition in some respects. And I think that that welding of the sacred and the secular is something that um, marked the early years of the post-apartheid period quite strongly. And obviously, um, is something that people are strongly critical of in some respects, since it has its limits, since it produces through the image of um, Bishop Tutu and others, um, a, a particularly r religiously inflected version of the political. So I think, just to say, and I need to think about um, the broader implications of your question, that um, in some respects, the move that the painting makes would be deeply familiar in public life. Um, but it would only make it more painful for the majority of African South Africans um, in the sense that it would seem to forebode the moment of his death. So a very complex um, intermeshing that would be typical of South Africa between a non-secular narrative born out of Christianity and Christian church with um, an African traditional narrative which would have very strong ideas about the representation of dead bodies and so on. Um, so I think all of that uh, in there, I think that it's very difficult to write about Mandela in a fully secular way and this is one of the things that I think we all deal with and I set out to write you know, an academic paper but I couldn't um, move away from um, the extraordinary impact that he, that he has on, on me and on so many people around me. So I'm not sure how to account for that and what language that belongs to. I can only say that when he went into Mill Park Hospital a year ago, just down the road from where I live in Johannesburg, there was a pervasive sense um, of extreme panic in, in people uh, and in myself. And um, it's something that, you know, I think people find it difficult to account for because we know that he's getting old and that he's going to die. Uh, and the extraordinary um, power of his presence and uh, immense love that people feel for him is something that uh, there's probably very few other people in the world today um, you know, is, is, is able to inspire. And the enigma of that is something uncertain. And I, so I just want to say for the moment that uh, it's, a, it's a mystery to me in some respects. In some ways I'm just mobilizing all the discourses available to me as a South African in public life. Um, in other ways, um, I'm sort of sitting with a, um, you know, the unusual power of a person's presence, which I, I imagine you would yourselves feel. Yeah. Uh, so my question is only, uh, I think, somewhat tangentially related to your talk, to your talk, but I was, and it's a very broad question, so you can um, answer it as you see fit. How, how similar? How similar or different do you think the South Africa of today is um, to the South Africa that 
that and then the light vision. So in a, in phrased in a different way, do you think that his vision of South Africa is something that is going to die with him? Mm -hmm. Or is it something that's going to die? I was in South Africa earlier this summer and mm -hmm. but I think some of the things that I saw made me a little disillusioned about the country is Mandela I've seen it. Absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, we know well that Nelson Mandela gets up every morning and if he doesn't do anything else all day, he reads the newspaper. And I often wonder what he thinks when he reads it. I think that um, South Africa is experiencing um, um, extremely weak leadership um, at the moment under President Zuma. And I think that um, for many years under the presidency of Thabo Mbeki, um, one had a very powerful sense of public life, freedom of the press, um, the sense that people were building towards a future in political terms. And I think that for the moment, a lot of that's gone out of the window. I also think that when you participate in such an enormous political struggle of such global proportions, that memory is not lost. And I think that the moment we're waiting for in South Africa is for incredible anger and emerging disillusionment um, to cohere around a new political struggle which is for decent leadership in the country. I think that what you've seen in the last three years is a fundamental change, which is the re-emergence of what you could call official culture in the way that those apartheid guys inhabited official culture. One of the great things when you have the re-emergence of official culture is that unofficial culture, resistance culture, re-emerges re at the same pace. So I think that you have this extraordinary anomaly of a country with an incredibly vital public civic life. Um, and a memory of political struggle, and you have the specter of weak leadership and corruption, which completely devastates the legacy of Nelson Mandela. Um, I wouldn't throw it all out the window. I think that it's a country that is so um, incredibly diverse and has experienced such agency in the lifetime of m many people, um, is, is still capable of um, producing a fundamental critique which um, might get it somewhere. At the same time, it is a depressing moment in South Africa. Um, and the question is, how did we get from Mandela to Zuma? Um, how did we manage to do that? And I, you know, I only think that the life of nations become extremely mediocre and have a moment of great brilliance. And then we return to dreadful mediocrity. But the fight is there. Um, the challenge is to receive the critique and to say that it's not over yet. The fight is going on, and we're trying to do that. I think that the two big questions that remain in South Africa today, which those of us who are working in the academy there, deliberately not coming to North America, the, the questions that we're trying to keep open are, um, you know, let's not narrow a definition of what the human is. Uh, let's keep it open. Let, let's do the work um, that it takes to keep open the notion of what a human being is. Um, and I think constantly what you get at government level is the attempt to reduce poor people to the recipients of service delivery instead of the full complex human beings that they are, for instance. Um, or if you look at what's going on around immigration laws, it's this attempt to shut down the capacity, the full capacity of people to be recognized as fully human. And I think that the other question that we are working well and strongly within the academy in South Africa is Hannah Arendt's reminder that there's a difference between liberation and freedom. Um, we've achieved a certain kind of political liberation, but the question now is what is freedom? How do we actually live together? And I think that's a global question. I think that question is under duress around the world. And so one can take heart from the fact that I think that people in the United States are struggling very, very badly with that question as well. And so that if we can find South African answers to those questions, we can also build a global conversation. I think that's what's really urgent. I think that's the underlying legacy of Nelson Mandela. And I don't think it's going to go away if people use their intelligence in a way that, um, in a way that really builds uh, and deepens democracy. Yes, uh, thank you so much for that. Um, I guess I'd be curious, two statements you made struck me. Um, one was that um, Mandela is one of the last true heroes, um, or something like that. Um, and then another was in response to one of the questions, there are very few people around the world who inspire the kind of um, response that he does. 
And I'm wondering if you have, if you can broaden the discussion of what it would mean to try to introduce some comparative figures. Yeah. yeah. You know, whether that would be historically, mm -hmm. something like, you know, the mm -hmm. names that occurred upon are Martin Luther King, mm -hmm. very different. Mm. Biography, very different. Mm. National sure. trauma because yeah. of a life cut profoundly short, but a figure who similarly embodied a profound national rift that you did. Yeah, I mean, I'm not. I'm glad you pick, picked up on that sentence. I'm not quite happy with it. I'm a literary scholar, and you know, sort of unambiguous questions of heroism don't essentially interest me that much. But I. Um, but I do think that you are interested. I mean, there's something important about his. Yeah. And there is something important about his exemplarity and his embodiment. Yeah. And I do feel that hero might not be the word yeah. that you want to rest with, but you are making a case for something very I'm exciting. making a case for it, and I'm also trying to make the case against it, as I did through the deaths of children in his family. Um, I'm certainly making a case for it implicitly. I've tried to think the life of Ansang Su Shi alongside the life of Mandela, and it hasn't worked for me yet. And I, they, they seem to me fundamentally different figures. And so if anyone can help me with that, I'd really appreciate it. I think that there's a great looming gap between African thinking and African American thinking. And it, I've been reminded of it again in US universities this time. A whole bunch of departments that call themselves African and African American studies. And there's very little engagement between the two bodies of work and philosophy. And I think that one of the things that would be extremely productive for us as we approach the coming death of Mandela would be to think on, along the lines of, well, questions of African futures. You know, the problem with so much of the work that's produced on Africa um, is that it's um, obsessed with the past, the African past. It seemed to me that one of the things that Mandela contributes to um, and enables us to do is to think constantly about what the future might look like. There's something in the substance of his thinking that opens onto the future. And what, I, what really interests me is to try to draw that together with African-American thinking, because it's so striking to me um, in the work of African-American thinkers that that concept of the future and what the future might look like is so alive. Um, and that's so striking, of course, in a country where African-Americans have been and are in a minority, contrary to South Africa where black South Africans are in a majority. Um, so, I mean, in terms of future work, I'd like to build an intellectual project and teach a class called African Futures, which would be drawing these two bodies of work together. I have not seen a really interesting study which draws Martin Luther King and Mandela together. And I think people have just not known how to do it. But I think that if we approach it in a very intellectual way and we say, well, what about this concept of thinking about the future, we might get somewhere. Um, so that would be one way to answer your question. <coughs> Gandhi and Mandela are interesting opposites, and it's quite difficult in a very complex and interesting way to put them in conversation. Um, I was wondering if you care to say a little bit more. Could you speak about, right into the microphone? Oh, so we can hear. if you can to say a little bit more about the, I guess, interplay of the individual, right, on the one hand, and the collective organization, right? In other words, um, and the, the, the reason why it's you know, across to me is the strand uh, of your paper that sort of reflected on what it would mean when Mandela dies, right? Because one can, one can say that the, the, the fact that uh, uh, an entire social energy or anxiety, collective anxiety, you know, uh, coalesces around the death of an individual opens up the sort of tension I'm trying to get at, mm -hmm. right? And I was wondering if in your reading of Mandela's writings, whether he addresses that tension. Because right? for an entire generation, as you know, it's Mandela as a figure of a struggle. In other words, it's precisely the symbolism mm -hmm. 
that, that matters, not the mortal individual, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so I was, I was just wondering, has Mandela himself reflected on that tension where his individuality gets not exactly subsumed, but the entire limited frame around him is in terms of apartheid and post-apartheid. Yeah, I mean, a number of things. Mandela, um, y you know, has gone to great lengths to articulate uh, a collective project over the individual body, as I've said. Um, I think that I've tried to show in my talk that he has wanted to give his own death a meaning, and he's wanted it to signify politically. I think the um, extraordinary feat that we've not fully understood yet um, of Mandela's life is to make it impossible to separate the personal story from the collective story. And I think that takes us straight through the moment of his death. Um, so my attempt has been to say, um, you know, do something, take the gift of my body and make it into a kind of politics um, that creates this national space um, as a democratic space. Um, Yeah. Let's see. Um. <laughs> no, you know, I, ha I mean, a number of things occurred to me as you were asking the question. That I think that. There's tremendous danger in valorizing his death too much, and it's been of great concern to me when I write this paper. Um, and it, it can easily form part of a kind of liberal discourse, adopted largely by white Europeans and South Africans and Americans, um, which partakes of incredibly unpleasant, dangerous, essentially racist discourse of Mandela, as exceptional as the one good native. What are we going to do when Mandela dies? And it's there, it's particularly there if you look closely at the discourses coming from Europe today. Um, I've presented this paper twice in South Africa, um, and both times young black South Africans have tested me on my project and what I'm doing. And sort of saying to me, look, he's going to die. You know, what's the thing? You know, he, of course we, of course he's, incredibly important to us. But he's going to die, he's old. What, you know, what's the obsession with his death? You know, and I've, I, I mean, I've had really great conversations with them, as one does in South Africa, in an incredibly open way. And I think that that danger remains. That why are we making such a fuss about this particular man's death when he's getting very old? Um, what I've tried to do is, is, is to build into the paper sections that you've not seen tonight about um, the way in which Mandela has been, has been fated in, in, in Euro-America. Um, and I don't, I don't think that that's the voice that I've used tonight. I do believe that on the day that he dies, we're going to be faced with an incredibly empty media discourse around the meaning of his life and the meaning of his death. And I've just, you know, I've wanted to um, reflect on it as much for myself as for other people. I think it's going to be a big deal. Um, but I fully acknowledge, and it might be behind, you know, what's behind your question in some respects, that there is a discourse out there, particularly amongst um, white people, um, that, you know, that Thabo Mbeki used to make fun of. You know, he used to say, when he was in a good mood, he used to say, oh, it's just Mandela exceptionalism. And when he was in a vicious mood, he used to say, yeah, it's the one good native syndrome. I mean, imagine being the successor. Of, of Mandela in the way that Thabo Mbeki was. I mean, he was not a father and he was not a son. He was a man who was fully grown, hated being patronized by Mandela. And so he used to articulate that, that worry. And so what can I say? I think that we need to be cautious in our analyses and, and cognizant 
of the way in which um, you know, race, racism works its way around the world, uh, even in relation to the figure of Mandela. Thanks for your talk. I'm Helen Brown, I'm asking for you. Um, it's really interesting to hear you reflect on him now. And my question isn't about his death, but it's about his legacy and what you said at the end, which I found so hopeful, is that South Africa is still capable of mounting a critique of the circumstances in the country. And, and mm -hmm. so, much, so often there's so much pessimism and despair about the current state of South Africa. So I want to focus on that. And when I think about Mandela and his legacy, and I'm always puzzled by the contradiction of his commitment to freedom and um, his unwillingness to really bring that into conversation to the ANC about the ANC. So I want to ask you about the ANC. And to what extent do you see Mandela having given us a language and an ability to critique the ANC that might find its way into the future? Because it seems to me if that critique is going to happen about the current state and society in South Africa, there has to be a really pointed critique of the ANC. And I don't know how Mandela gave us that. And, and I'm wondering if, if you see that, that I think it's a very, it's a very living legacy in political terms. I mean, the, the, the example one would immediately point to is that, you know, the, the critique that was made of, of Mandela during his presidency in the sense that he didn't deal with the AIDS crisis that was growing, you know. And then um, really made it his business in the years after his presidency to, um, to give a huge public profile to, to HIV AIDS. Um, and you know, one sees him once again trying to work through the mistakes in his life in a fundamental way. Um, so I mean, I think that his first legacy, which is very seldom on offer these days in the current South African government, um, you, you know, to say that I was wrong, that I made a mistake on that, and I'm going to, I'm, I'm now going to, in a very public way, um, work with that. And so we have this extraordinary shift from a country whose president didn't believe in the AIDS crisis to a country which has the biggest rollout in the world um, and is now very effectively dealing with the AIDS, um, AIDS crisis. So, I mean, I would say that, that that particular gesture is one that one receives from Mandela. Um, and, and, and tries to, to work with. Um, I think that what's going to happen in South Africa very soon is a massive anti-corruption lobby, and I think that the figure of Mandela, and indeed the figure of, of Thabo Mbeki as well, stand very strongly um, as um, contradictory versions of the African modern um, to the notion of, um, of corruption at government level. I think that all of these things get pulled through. I, you know, it's always curious, and you will have heard this many times, that um, the view of South Africa from the north is always more depressing than the view of South Africa from the inside. And it's a curious thing. And so what we're working with, um, I think very carefully, of course, is the fact that the, the, the potent critique of governments, the articulation, as I said, of official culture, and the incredible resources in the society as a whole, intellectual, academic, and otherwise, to mobilize um, resistance and critique. So, um, the, the, the key questions that we have to face now, and there's no ways that Mandela's legacy doesn't help us to do that, are questions of poverty and wealth. Um, and questions relating to inequality, which relate back to um, relations to the self, and his very public articulation um, of a politics of selflessness. Um, I think that uh, the very difficult question is what South Africa is, want to, is doing and wants to do with the question of race. Because I think that what you get in the Mandela period and through the years of the anti-apartheid struggle it's a very powerful vision of non-racialism. And then you get years under Mbeki's leadership where say, no, 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 we're not having any of that, we're gonna do black empowerment. I mean, really what we have to do is change the economic conditions um, of people's lives. And what you get kicking in at that point is redress. And one of the complicated things about redress is of course that it re-racializes um, the language of the public sphere. 
So you're trying to make an argument, as Mandela did, for non-racialism. In order to redress the inequities of the past, you have to rename people as colored Indian white, and so on. And you have to, once again, say, this is your category, and we will deliver service to you. And so the really pressing question is how do we um, ar ar articulate um, a, a version of race which undoes what apartheid tried to do? which is to, you know, and when I come to the US and I go to events and people talk about the post-racial, they completely shut down the potential of that. Um, but it seems to me something important to hold on to in relation to Mandela's legacy. So it's, it's a great big messy volatile soup in some respects. Um, but I have com absolutely every confidence when I teach my students and talk to people um, that they have a complex legacy to draw on and that, um, that um, Increasingly, people are laughing in, in the most potent and useful way at the current leadership. And I think when people start laughing, things start happening. Um, and I think that the moment of Mandela's death might well unleash a new set of reflections about what his politics looked like and you know, how it might teach us something about the future, in fact. <laughs> I really enjoyed the conversation, but I have a, um, a question, a very open-ended question. Um, it's, it's a question of winning. Um, you mentioned the but um, do you have um, anything to say about the, the, the role of winning, the problem of winning, uh, in, possibly in the situation that we have, you know, the, the kind of um, the, the matter of the Zuma problem? Mm -hmm. When does winning, winning we not understand um, in this um, trajectory? Yeah, I mean, the, the, yeah, the figure of Winnie is, um, you know, to me she represents a painful and complex figure that I um, want absolutely nothing to do with politically because I think that she um, suffered despicably through the 27 years of his imprisonment. And I think that um, she wasn't somehow able to hold on to the kind of moral vision that perhaps prison allowed him to do. The kind of, purity of his, his vision. I think that um, she's a deeply compromised figure, and I think that her alliance with a young activist called Juli Julius Malema, who's appeared on the political stage and is mobilizing the most sort of base populism, um, is compromising her further. On the other hand, this young Malema, who's extremely talented and charismatic, is articulating a truth about South African society which is economic apartheid, which is that we, that we have in front of us an economic struggle. And it's that that Winnie's hearing. I mean, she hears that, she understands that. Her, all her political um, radar, which is very deep, understands that Malema, in some respects, is articulating the key critique of South African society. So I think Winnie, as many people have said, is, is a somewhat um, tragic figure in some respects, extremely talented politician in her own right, but somebody who couldn't hold on to the moral high ground that I think Mandela wanted, wanted and argued for, and has increasingly you know, taken the wrong side in, in political struggles and political leadership, and is deeply compromised as a result. Quite happy to finish, shall we, shall we wrap up? <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.